In this video, we are going to take a look at later British battlecruisers and how they came about. To which, I think it's an appropriate start to immediately bring in Admiral Fisher into our story. When World War I was first starting out, Prince Louis of Battenberg was first Sea Lord of the Admiralty, and due to a myriad of reasons, mostly from anti-German sentiments running rather high, Fisher would replace him. To which he began a large-scale construction program. Through his talents as an administrator, he would circumvent the bureaucratic procedures of the Admiralty and deal with the design department, shipbuilding firms, and material suppliers, and so on directly. The system would be built on trust and mutual support mostly. And within a few months, he had set the construction of a new large fleet including destroyers, submarines, patrol craft, etc. But most important to us, he wanted to build new battlecruisers to strengthen the Grand Fleet against the newest German battlecruisers, of which we've talked about a number on the channel. Fisher brought with him his original idea for the battlecruiser, with areas of concern for the new vessel being speed and the tactical strategic advantages that would come from it. This concept of speed was very important to Fisher. In a quote from British Battlecruisers 1905 to 1920 by John Roberts, in a letter that Fisher had written to Churchill in 1912, he says, quote, There must be sacrifice in armor, there must be further and greater increase in speed. Your speed must vastly exceed that of your possible enemy. End quote. With this, Fisher was advocating that all armored ships should have speeds in excess of 30 knots, but this plea would go unheeded, as the 1913-1914 battleship class, the Royal Sovereigns, would have the standard battle fleet speed of 21 knots. But as for Sea Lord, Fisher would be in a much better position to push his ideas. He would soon set the director of naval construction to work on a 32-knot battlecruiser with 15-inch guns, the never-built Radamanthus, with a rough outline of the battlecruiser as of December 21st, having a displacement of 25,750 tons and a top speed of 32 knots, six 15-inch guns, 24-inch guns, and torpedoes, with possible belt armor as thick as 6 inches. This campaign Fisher would embark on would last until the new year, attempting to get three of these ships built. Another thing that would be important would be Fisher's suggestion to Churchill to suspend the building of the two battleships, Renown and Repulse, ordered from Fairfields and Palmers, respectively. Being suspended on the 26th of August, 1914, due to the fact that they would not be complete in time to take part in the war. Fisher wanted to convert them into battlecruisers. Now, the term convert is a term that should be applied very loosely, as it would be the modification of the design of these battleships, as they did not exist anywhere except on paper, and the materials already gathered in the shipyards for their construction. Churchill would fear these large vessels would take up too many resources, as the materials could go to other ships, and those could be ready before the war would end, believing that the war would not last too long. While Fisher, on the other hand, thought the war would last longer, and that he could repeat his performance with the 1905-1906 construction of the Dreadnought, and get these vessels built very quickly. To save time, he would continue the contracts necessary for the proposed battleships that could be used for the new battlecruisers instead, particularly the eight 15-inch twin gun mountings, which had been ordered in March of 1914. Still, in December of 1914, Fisher's campaign would be bolstered by the victory at the Falkland Islands, writing to Admiral Jellicoe, and again taking this letter from British battlecruisers in 1905-1920 by John Roberts. Fisher writes, I am now here fighting the battle for more battlecruisers. I wish, when you have the leisure, you would write me a casual sort of letter, which I can show the cabinet, not as if you were responding to my request, not an official memorandum, that the supposed existing superiority we have in fast battleships that we now have is fallacious, more especially in quoting the Queen Elizabeth, as they do. None of our existing ships have the necessary future speed. The new German Lutzow battlecruiser, with possibly 14-inch guns, or even 16-inch guns, will certainly have over 28 knot speed. We must have 32 knot speed, to give us the margin for being long out of dock, and to give the necessary speed to catch a 28 knot ship. Speed is everything. It would save me an immense amount of trouble if you would kindly send this letter to Beatty, as being the admiral commanding the battlecruiser squadron, if he could support me with a private letter, written in a casual way. I have to resort to every stratagem to gain my mind. If I don't get these three battlecruisers of 32 knot speed, I shall have to leave the admiralty on January 25th next. By the 28th of December, Churchill would give in and obtain cabinet approval for the construction of two new battlecruisers. The new battlecruisers would take on the names of the two Royal Sovereign class ships, ordered from Fairfields and Palmers. While Palmers did not have a long enough slipway for the ships, their contract would be transferred to the John Brown at Clydebank. Fisher would interview the contractors on the 29th of December and obtain an agreement to an accelerated construction time of 15 months 
from the date the order, which was December 30th. Fisher would continue another campaign for vessels he would describe as large light cruisers, but better described as light battle cruisers, armed with two twin 15-inch gun turrets. The description as light cruisers was really a ploy to get cabinet approval because the construction of further battle cruisers and battleships had been vetoed, but the construction of light cruisers had not. Very sneaky of Fisher. The construction of these so-called light cruisers, Courageous, Glorious, and later Furious, is something we will discuss in a further video. Anyway, the first mention of the requirements for the new battle cruisers is from mid-December when the Director of Naval Construction would receive a request from Fisher of the following characteristics. A long high flared bow, like the pre-dreadnought Renown, but higher, four 15-inch guns in twin mountings as high above the water as in the original dreadnought, an anti-torpedo boat armament of 24-inch guns on the upper deck, mounted high up and with shield protection only. No other guns or torpedoes to be fitted. Speed of 32 knots, oil fuel only, and armor the same scale as HMS Indefatigable. More changes to Fisher's requirements would follow. The first one increasing the main battery, and now a requirement of six guns would be in order, and the addition of two torpedo tubes. During the first week of January, the material on hand at Fairfield and Palmer's for the two battleships that were originally supposed to be built was examined by the DNC's department to see how much could be used for the new ships, and the material was transferred from Palmer's to John Brown. By the middle of the month of January, the builders had enough information to order the additional materials for the ship and would have enough information and supplies to build the hulls as far out as the bilge. And by the 25th of January, 1915, on Fisher's 74th birthday, as it happens, both HMS Renown and Repulse would be laid down. By the end of January, they would have the requirements for the remainder of the hull structure in order the steel required to build it. The DNC would have the drawings, specifications, and calculations normally prepared by the 12th of April, 1915, and it had board approval 10 days later. There would be little changes from the design set forth on the 30th of December, but there would be some changes. Displacement had increased by 500 tons due to modifications of the armor and machinery. More changes would happen, though. The original 4-inch gun battery protected by 3-inch armor would be replaced by upper deck mountings and open shields, and the reduction of the guns from 25 to 17. 15 of the guns would be placed in triple mountings to provide a high volume of fire and ease the problem of distributing the guns of the anti-torpedo boat armament, clear of the blast from the heavy guns and each other. The design for the ships as of April 22, 1915, a displacement of 26,500 tons, machinery to produce 110,000 shaft horsepower with a 32-knot top speed, a main armament of six 15-inch guns with two turrets forward and one aft, 17 4-inch guns, two 3-inch anti-aircraft guns, five maximum machine guns, and two torpedo tubes. The side armor would have 6 inches amidships, 4 inches fore, and 4 and 3 inches aft. The bulkheads would have 4 inches of armor, 4 inches and 3 inches fore, along with 4 and 3 inches aft. The barbettes would have 7 inches of armor. The conning tower would have 10 inches. The 4-inch batteries would still have 3 inches of armor, while the maximum thickness of the main deck would be 2 inches, but the lower deck would have 2.5 inches. Some additional notes. In April of 1915, it was decided that the ships would not be fitted with wood decks in order to economize on weight and construction time. Lagging was fitted under the weather decks and in living spaces to compensate for the loss of insulation and deck strips were fitted to improve the foothold on the steel deck. Cortisine, a type of linoleum decking, would be fitted to the forecastle deck and in the area of the admiral's accommodations. In May of 1915, stiffening to the forward section of the hull, following experience in the Queen Elizabeth battleships, which had shown some weakness in the area. In November of 1915, it was discovered that the revolving weight of the 15-inch mountings had been underestimated by 20 tons, so the additional 60 tons was appropriated by the board margin. With the additional changes, Repulse would weigh 26,850 tons, and Renown would be somewhat larger at 27,420 tons. The ships would be complete in fall of 1916, being constructed very rapidly for ships as large as they are. Repulse would have a 31.7 knot top speed on her trials, and Renown would achieve 32.6 knots. I will close this first part out by discussing a possible origin for Renown and Repulse as possibly put down to Fisher's Baltic project, but it's more likely that Repulse and Renown were meant to strengthen the battle cruiser force of the Grand Fleet. While there is more ambiguity with the three large light cruisers, Courageous, Glorious, and Furious, the Baltic project was an old idea of Fisher's, which basically consisted of landing a Russian army on the Baltic coast of Pomerania, 90 miles from Berlin, which would directly threaten the capital and need the Germans to redistribute troops, 
relieving pressure on the Russian front, but ultimately leading to panic and collapse. In the next part, I'll cover the three large light cruisers. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this video, and please remember to like and subscribe. I will open up the second part by picking up where we left off last time, which was discussing the possible origins of the battle cruisers HMS Repulse and Renown, along with the large light cruisers Courageous, Glorious, and Furious. The Baltic project was an old idea of Admiral Fisher's, which basically consisted of landing a Russian army on the Baltic coast of Pomerania, 90 miles from Berlin, which would directly threaten the capital and necessitate the Germans to redistribute troops, relieving pressure on the Russian front, but ultimately leading to panic and collapse. During the years of 1914 and 1915, it would be one of several plans discussed by the Admiralty for using the Navy to break the deadlock of the armies on the continent. Other plans would include landing troops on the Belgian coast and an assault on the Dardanelles, the preferred project of Churchill which would eventually be chosen to execute. Now, there would be other plans including seizing the islands near the German coast to either observe the movements of the German fleet or as a possible jumping off point for an invasion of Schleswig-Holstein and the seizure of the Kiel Canal. That's all to say that these plans would be related to the Baltic project, as it would give access to the Baltic to the Grand Fleet, but before it could transfer to the Baltic, the German High Seas Fleet would either need to be defeated or somehow prevented from entering the North Sea. Fischer would see these large light cruisers or light battle cruisers as a support vessel for his Baltic project, to which an interesting letter Fischer wrote about the vessels to Sir Eustace Henry William Tenyonson, Dane Court, in March of 1915, to which I'm getting from British Battle Cruisers 1905 to 1920 by John Roberts. Fisher writes, I've told the First Lord that the more I consider the qualities of your design of the big light battle cruisers, the more I am impressed by its exceeding excellence and simplicity. All three vital requirements of gunpowder, speed, and draft of water are so well balanced. Beardmore and Vickers, neither of whom was to build one of these ships, are absolutely sure that they can produce two ships in 11 months which alone is a testimony to the goodness of the design as regards to simplicity. However, I fear we are not going to even get two out of the four owing to the parliamentary bugbear delaying the four ships of the royal sovereign type. It's a great pity as it will be very greatly regretted. The present light small cruisers get their speed knocked down to once at 15 knots in heavy weather, so it will be of no use to accompany them and scout for the battle cruisers, and may fall prey to the enemy's battle cruisers if caught by them scouting in heavy weather. Now, the designation Large Light Cruiser is an interesting one. As Fisher would continue to campaign for more vessels, he would describe as Large Light Cruisers, but they would be better described as Light Battle Cruisers, armed with two 15-inch gun turrets. The description as Large Light Cruisers was really a ploy to get cabinet approval, because the construction of further battle cruisers and battleships had been vetoed, but the construction of Light Cruisers had not. Fisher would also comment to Danecourt that these ships be used against enemy cruisers that might reach the open sea to attack merchant ships, as well as describing the 18-inch gun Furious and how it would be used in his Baltic project, as well as a possible 20-inch gun vessel for future projects, hoping that these large guns would be able to assist in his hoped invasion of Pomerania. Another interesting thing to note would be the shallow draft of these ships, and a quote from British battle cruisers, quote, the specific shallow draft also provided in Renown and Repulse and later Hood class is also far from a straightforward Baltic requirement. Shallow draft was necessary for close inshore operations and could have been used to enable them to use waters denied to enemy heavy ships of deep draft, but it was also seen as valuable for other reasons. End quote. Now, to get into the actual development of Courageous and Glorious, their plans were submitted for approval in late January of 1915 essentially being reduced versions of Renown, with the removal of B turret, and the hull armor reduced to that of a light cruiser, but would enjoy the adoption of small tube boilers and geared turbines, which would save weight and improve the efficiency of their machinery installation. Another improvement for Courageous and Glorious would be that their bulkheads would be increased to a uniform thickness of 1.5 inches, which would add an additional 500 tons to their displacement, and increase their draft as well as reducing their speed. This was hoped to be done to renown and repulse for fear of underwater attack, but the ships were too far along in their construction, and with the additional time required to do so, it was considered unacceptable. With these changes to Courageous and Glorious, they would be laid down in late March and April of 1915 respectively. While under construction, a major addition was that of deck plating, following the Battle of Jutland, which would add an additional 400 tons to their displacement. Now there would be other changes to the vessels, as they would come in 1,700 tons heavier than the original estimations. A change could have possibly been the installation of the triple 4-inch mounting, with the original estimation providing for 16 4-inch mountings. 
As for the particulars of the vessels of the courageous class, as of the 28th of January, 1915, they would be 17,400 tons, later to be 17,800 tons. The machinery for 90,000 shaft horsepower with a top speed of 32 knots. An armament of four 15-inch guns and two twin turrets, 16 4-inch guns, three 3-inch anti-aircraft guns, along with five Maxim machine guns and two torpedo tubes. As for armor, they would have side thicknesses of 3 inches amidships and 2 inches forward, barbettes of a max thickness of 7 inches, conning tower thickness of 10 inches, gun shields would vary in thickness at 13 inches, 11 inches, and 7 inches, along with torpedo bulkheads of 3 quarters of an inch, and a maximum deck thickness of 1 inch sloped. As for Furious, who would be more like a half-sister as compared to the vessels of the Courageous class, being laid down in 1915 as well. With her aforementioned 18-inch guns, she would displace 19,200 tons with machinery for 90,000 shaft horsepower and a top speed of 31.5 knots, and two 18-inch guns, one in one turret forward and one aft, along with eight 5.5-inch guns, three 3-inch anti-aircraft guns, five Maxim machine guns, and two torpedo tubes. Her armor layout would be similar to the Courageous class, differing in main deck thickness, having a maximum thickness of 1.75 inches. Courageous and Glorious would take around 18 months to build, with Courageous running trials in October of 1916 and Glorious in December. Courageous would suffer structural damage while working up to full speed against the rough sea, with the forecastle and other areas buckling, along with some leaks in the oil tanks. There would be about 130 tons of weight added to help stiffen up the ships. Now, these ships would be prime suspects for carrier conversion later in their service history. Now, to go into Furious's conversion a little bit here, because I find hers to be the most interesting out of the three, as Furious's first conversion was a partial conversion, removing the fore turret and replacing it with a flight deck and a hangar, as seen by this photo from the Imperial War Museum. Later in the winter between 1917 and 1918, she would have the rear 18-inch gun removed, and a second flight deck fitted between the funnel and the stern, becoming a fully-fledged aircraft carrier, later being modified to include a full-length flight deck, as well as her half-sisters Courageous and Glorious. And to quote from British battle cruisers once more, quote, Despite their unpromising start, the large light cruisers became true representatives of the capital ship of the future. End quote. I would like to apologize for this video not being quite as long as the first part, which can be explained by the fact I just have a ton of schoolwork to do at the time of writing this, and I tend to have to stay up quite late to write these. Also, because I attempted to write the development of the Admiral class into this video, and that would have been like a 20 page long script as I have found out, and I just don't have the time to record that. Also because HMS Hood is arguably the most famous vessel of the Interworld Royal Navy, and possibly of the Second World War, I think it's appropriate that her development gets its own video. But as I'm sitting here and recording this, a uh, thought just came to my mind. How would you guys like it if I actually edited all these videos together once they were finished and released them as a full length video? So it would probably run somewhere in the 20 to 25 minute range I think. If you guys would like that, please let me know down in the comments below. So enough with my excuses, and with that, I'll leave you guys until next time, my friends. And instead of the usual ending, why don't you go tell someone special that you love them? Welcome back to our series on the revival of British battle cruisers. In this episode, we will discuss the development of the Admiral class of battle cruisers. I hope you guys have enjoyed this series as much as I have. Anyway, at the end of 1915, the Admiralty would gain approval from the Treasury for an experimental battleship of which the designs would be based on wartime experience. The armament and speed was supposed to be similar to that of the Queen Elizabeth class of battleships, but an improved seaworthiness and a more up-to-date underwater protection scheme. Another focal point would be a high, uninterrupted freeboard, making it safer for the secondary battery armament and casements, as in older ships they are hard to use in rough seas and they would make the ships very dangerous. Again, to quote from British Battlecruisers 1905-1920 by John Roberts, quote, the situation was made worse by the fact that the ships seldom operated in their design load condition. They went to sea deep with a full fuel load and were generally running at deep drafts and low freeboard in the operational area, lighter loading conditions only being likely while returning to base after an extended period at sea." End quote. High freeboard and shallow draft were to reduce the underwater profile of the ship and the difficulties with dealing with underwater damage. The length to beam ratio increased accordingly. During the period between 1915 to 1916, the Director of Naval Construction would produce several designs for battleships of various specifications. These designs would cause concerns due to difficulties with docking facilities, particularly the fact that there were no floating docks that could accommodate them. The DNC preferred the designs with greater beam due to experiments showing underwater protection being improved with increased depth 
as well as the adoption of small tube boilers in order to save space and weight. The designs would be submitted to Jellico for comment in January of 1916. He did not seem pleased with them, saying how the Grand Fleet did not need new battleships but escort vessels, and the only weakness in large vessels was possibly in battle cruisers, being greatly concerned about the battle cruisers under construction in Germany. The three most recent ones being feared to have a top speed of 30 knots and an armament of 15.2 inch guns. Jellico would support the designs of a 30 knot battle cruiser and would also state that the vessels of the renowned and courageous type to be sufficient in speed, but would be lacking in protection, whose views would be supported by Beatty, who did not think the older 12-inch gun armed battlecruisers much use in action due to their lack of speed, fearing being outnumbered as well as outclassed by a faster, more powerfully armed German battlecruiser force. He was anxious to see how ships like Renown and Repulse would restore the balance in battlecruisers. In that same light, he did not think very highly of the large light cruisers, describing them as freak ships. Now, due to the opinion of these senior officers, the focus was switched immediately from battleships to battlecruisers, and by February of 1916, there were two designs, essentially a continuation of the battleship project, but with an emphasis on speed. Design 1 would displace 39,000 tons, 8,000 more than any battleship project, along with a main battery of 8 15-inch guns, while Design 2 was essentially the same thing, except it would have small tube boilers instead of large ones, saving 3,500 tons on displacement, and gave it a half-knot speed advantage over the proposed speed of Design 1. Design 3 would follow a similar line, this time with machinery to reach a 32-knot top speed. Designs 4 through 6 again would follow a similar line as 2, just with varying combinations of 18-inch guns. Coming at the request of Jellico, that a larger gun than 15 inches should be given serious consideration, but the minimum amount of guns should be 8, as any less could produce difficulties in accurate fire control and reduce weight of broadside. Essentially cutting out designs 4 and 5, design 8 was felt that it would be rejected for being too large, not to mention the fact that delays would be probable due to supply problems with 18-inch guns and their mountings, as only Armstrong had plant capabilities to deal with guns of that size. After about a month, the DNC was asked to continue work on design 3 in greater detail and to provide an alternative and to increase the secondary battery to 16 5 half inch guns. These two designs would be called Design A and B. Design B would be preferred, with the final design being approved by the board on April 7, 1916. Now, the main difference between the two designs was the thickness of armor, causing an increase of displacement. On April 19th, three ships would be ordered, with John Brown, Camel and Laird, and Fairfields. A fourth ship would be ordered by Armstrong and Whitworth on the 13th of June, and on the 14th of July, they would be given the names Hood, Howe, and Rodney, and Anson, respectively. Hood would be laid down on May 31st. The Battle of Jutland would take place that same day, and would drastically alter Hood's design. Due to the experiences of the Battle of Jutland, Hood's design was reconsidered, taking the opinions of Jellicoe during a consultation at the Admiralty. Changes would be made dated to 5th July, 1916 in which the DNC was instructed to improve the deck protection and turret and barbette armor. Compensation for the added weight being obtained was achieved by reducing the thickness of the upper belt. Ammunition hatches and dredger hoists on the main deck were to be enclosed with 1-inch bulkheads and the number of dynamos increased from 4 to 8, which was already under consideration before the Battle of Jutland. Now to quote from British battlecruisers once more. The second, Design A, the one that we've been talking about, Produced at the instigation of the DNC was for a much more drastic improvement to the protection, aimed at converting the ship into a fast battleship, end quote, which involved increasing the thickness of the vertical armor generally by 50%, which, with some more minor additions to the deck protection, adding an additional 3,100 tons to the displacement. An additional feature of the design was four above-water torpedo tubes on each side on the upper deck. The DNC's proposal would result in a request for him to consider variations on the 20th of July. Three more designs would be submitted, with the same particulars as Design A, but with some changes. Design B would displace 43,100 tons, 12 15-inch guns and four triple turrets, a 30.5 knot top speed, it'd carry the same amount of shells as Design A, but reduce the amount of rounds carried per gun, from 120 to 80. This could not have been done without increasing the size of the shell rooms, which would have meant either a reduction in the size of the machinery spaces, and therefore a reduction in speed, or an increase in size beyond available docking limits. Design C and D would follow similar lines as Design B, with variations in the layout of the main battery. In the case of Design C, 10 15-inch guns and two triple turrets and two twin turrets, and in Design D, 
nine guns, and three triple turrets. These four designs, including A, would go to the controller on the 26th of July, 1916. Now, after considering these designs, the board approved design A for Hood on the 1st of September, 1916. But later in September, protection would be revised again, as more analysis and more lessons from the Battle of Jutland were brought to light. And a quote from British battle cruisers once more, A, thickness of side armor between upper and fore castle decks, reduced from 6 inches to 5 inches, and between main and upper decks increased from 6 inches to 7 inches. B, forecastle deck amidships increased from 1.75 inches to 2 inches. C, upper deck forward increased from 1 inch to 2 inch, and areas of 2 inch and 1 inch plating aft extended. D, main deck over magazines increased from 2 inches to 3 inches, and aft from 1.5 inches to 2 inches. E, lower deck aft increased from 1 inch to 1.5 inches and 1 inch, end quote. The changes would ensure that the minimum thickness of 9 inches of protection would have to be penetrated by a projectile, striking at angles of descent of up to 30 degrees. The protection would be approved in early October, but protection would be continued to be debated by Jellico and Beatty until the end of the war. Continued alterations to the armor scheme would be seen by an additional 55 tons for gun shields. By the 20th of August, 1917, the approximate final design of Hood would be complete. Displacement of 41,200 tons, machinery for 144,000 shaft horsepower, a top speed of 31 knots due to an increase in weight, an armament of eight 15-inch guns and two twin turrets, two forward and two aft, 16 5.5-inch guns, four 4-inch four high-angle guns, and two submerged torpedo tubes, and eight above-water torpedo tubes. As for armor, I feel like me showing a table would illustrate the armor scheme a lot better than me just saying it out loud, so I'll put that up on screen now. Alright, after that, it's important to note Hood would differ from her sisters because she was so far into building that they could not incorporate any further changes. This would be rather interesting because as of the 9th of March 1917, Hood's sisters had been suspended due to the amount of labor and resources it would take to build these large vessels, as the resources could be used instead for escort vessels in the face of German U-boat attacks, although it was not an easy decision to make because there was a great fear that British battlecruiser construction was no match for new German construction, as the Germans had six battlecruisers under construction, along with others being ordered. Now I promise we will discuss those at some point in the future, as I do love German battlecruisers, as most of you know. Beatty would push to get Hood's construction expedited and her sister's construction to be restarted, because he wanted to be able to match the speed and armor protection of these new German ships. However, no further work would continue on Anson, Howe, and Rodney and they would be eventually cancelled by the 27th of February, 1919. Hood would see further modifications as their construction continued. In August 1918, they would increase the thickness of the crowns of the magazines from 1 inch to 2 inches. To compensate for this, the protection of the funnel uptakes above the forecastle deck was omitted. In February of 1919, her mast would be modified, and in May, the main deck at the side increased to 3 inches of armor abreast magazines. To compensate for this, about 100 tons of weight would be taken out through the removal of four 5.5 inch guns and their ammunition supply arrangements were to be omitted. Finally, in July of 1919, it was approved to increase the thickness of the deck armor, which was to be compensated with the removal of the added weight from the above water torpedo tubes and their protection, and the armor walls of the torpedo control tower was to be greatly reduced. But this was never fit. While four of the eight above water torpedo tubes would be kept as a peacetime fitting for possible training purposes, HMS Hood would be commissioned in May of 1920 as a battlecruiser. I think it is really appropriate to close this video out with one final thing from John Roberts, British Battlecruisers from 1905 to 1920. He writes, However, she was still an extension of pre-war ideas, and having evolved directly from the Queen Elizabeth class, did not fully incorporate the lessons of the war, particularly with regard to protection, which had been improved in patching together piecemeal since the time of Jutland. Major improvements in the design of capital ships were envisaged for post-war ships, but the imposition of international treaty restrictions over the construction of such ships soon brought these plans to an end, and enabled Hood to remain one of the world's most advanced designs well into the 1930s." End quote. Anyway, to carry on with something I said in the last video, go tell a loved one that you love them.